Very few video games are legendary. And even fewer of those legendary games are puzzle games. So in a sea of crazy puzzle games, some of which that are absolutely terrible, there's one god to rule them all. Tetris for the original Game Boy. But we're not going to be talking about the Game Boy version. We're going to be talking about the lesser known yet still popular NES variant. And it's many, many, many sequels. Some people may have heard of Tetris 2. But have you heard of Tetris 2? But you may not have seen Hatris. That, come, that came out of nowhere. But before we jump into that, let's talk about the Tetris effect and the history of Tetris. Before we continue though, if you haven't already, subscribe, ring that bell, and drop a like. I have lots more content planned. I know I took a six months break, but I'm back and I'm doing my best. So please, feel free to subscribe and share this video with a friend. Now let's get back to Tetris. I am at Anthrocon 2024, here to discuss specifically Tetris of all things. You see, there are many different versions of Tetris, but specifically I want to talk about the different versions and different sequels made for the NES and Famicom. We might touch up on some of the Game Boy sequels as well, just because there are some parallels, but we're going to jump in. But first, I'd also like to talk about something that's most important to this discussion, and that is the Tetris Effect and how it matters. Believe it or not, the Tetris Effect is something that's been seen in multiple papers. It's not just an, oh, a PlayStation 4 title. Believe it or not, the idea of the Tetris Effect uh, was something that was seen all the way back during the early development of Tetris. People just couldn't stop playing the game. But what we found in recent years is that even people with dementia, memory loss, and memory issues still remember Tetris while they sleep or wake up. Believe it or not, it helps strengthen memory just a little bit. It may not be a full piece of a puzzle, but what's even more fascinating is the ways in which Tetris has impacted our day-to-day -day life. In particular, with buildings, and structures, of, and the color combinations we use to design those buildings. And even just looking at cities, we can see some of the same patterns we find while playing the game of Tetris. Large structures, lots of empty spaces. Believe it or not, it's hard to imagine where we might be without the Tetris effect. Although, it might not be fair to just call it the Tetris effect at this point, seeing as it goes back millennia. Tetris by the little-known studio Bulletproof Software is our first look at what NES Tetris could be and is a baseline for everything we're going to be talking about in this video. But let's start at the beginning. In 1984, Alexei Patronov came up with the idea for Tetris. In 1985, he put the first version of Tetris on the Electronica 60, a computer at the Academy of Sciences. Of course, the USSR had a very strict copyright. Individuals and companies couldn't own full copyright to any property Alexi only gave the rights out for home computers and arcades, not game consoles. That would come a little later. The rights got shifted around so much, so many people thought they had the rights to Tetris that it was a legal nightmare. Eventually, the rights for the arcade versions would end up in the hands of Sega, who got their sub-license from Atari. Their version of Tetris would be a massive hit. I've actually played on a real machine, I've got to say this game is pretty fun. It's not crazy, it won't blow your socks off, but it's fun. And eventually they ended up making a Genesis version and getting in legal trouble with Nintendo because of it. But we're not there yet. Let's back it up a little. Bit. In 1988, Bulletproof Software's founder, Hank Rogers, saw Tetris at a computer electronics show in Vegas. He got a license to publish Tetris in Japan for computers and he released this version on several home computers, and even simple word processors. 
This was at a time where computers and word processors were two different machines, but still related. Not something for this video, so we're not going to be looking at their initial ports for computers. We're actually going to be looking at a port that came out later that same year. After Sega and Atari had released their versions, Bulletproof Software eventually ended up developing a Famicom version of their work. Now this was illegal. It wasn't illegal to buy, it wasn't illegal to own, and it wasn't illegal to play. But Hank Rogers did not have the license to release on home consoles. In 1989, Hank would go out to Moscow to try to get the rights. He ended up becoming friends with Alexei, in that time and ended up founding the company Animatech. And because of Hank Rogers' close connection with Nintendo and their Famicom, they ended up getting the rights not only for Tetris on Game Boy, but also Tetris on NES. And this time the license was legit, allowing Tetris by Bulletproof Software to be sold in Japan properly. Now here's a little anecdote I'd like to mention. The Tetris Wikipedia page apparently says that this is the first time a commercially licensed game from outside Japan was released commercially in Japan. But I think I'm going to call BS on that. There's no cited source. I couldn't find a single source on the internet saying it. When I look up commercially licensed titles, I find things from way back in the 70s for arcades and even earlier on the Atari 2600, with some of their fantastic titles like Centipede and Millipede. So that's most of this covered. Sega eventually tried to publish the arcade version of Tetris that they had made for the Mega Drive. However, it didn't reach the masses and was pulled from shelves a few days later, making it one of the rarest versions of Tetris. Since then, Tetris and Sega have partnered together to make Poyo Poyo Tetris, and if you own a Sega Genesis Mini, you actually have a legit licensed version of this game. But I'm getting way ahead of myself and way out of the scope of this video. Now that the history lesson's over, let's jump into the Famicom version of Tetris. Starting this one up is different. When you play Tetris, there's a level of muscle memory that's been built up over years and years and years of playing games like Tetris, from Puyo Puyo to other puzzle games. I knew it was going to be a bit different, maybe a bit rough around the edges. Just knowing that the developers of this game were more familiar with older computers whose main input device is a keyboard, but when I finally started playing, I wasn't expecting just how much they didn't understand the NES controller. Moving a piece is done entirely with the D-pad, left, right, and rotating. Up does nothing, which I felt was very odd, only to learn that the B button does absolutely nothing as well. I then hit A and watch my I then hit A and watch as my piece flung to the bottom of the board. And here's where the challenge came in. I had to unlearn my muscle memory. If nothing else, this Tetris game is probably the most difficult Tetris title I have played right behind Tetris the Grandmasters for vastly different reasons. If you want to pick up this game today, understand that moving your piece with the D-pad and down button takes some getting used to, and even after around 30 minutes, I was still struggling to unlearn it. This goes back to years and years and years of hand-eye coordination, but also plays a role in the Tetris effect that I mentioned earlier, where you focus on something so hard, eventually it implants itself in your memories, your dreams, your ideas, and all it takes is just a little piece to focus on, and the simpler that piece is, the bigger role it'll play in your life. So just like the way the older control styles have played that role, this newer control scheme would take longer to get used to because it breaks the mold of what I've already understood. But once I finally did get a grasp on the controls, I thought through their thought process. Rotating a piece is like moving a piece left or right, however, you're spinning it counterclockwise, but you're still moving that piece left and right even if it doesn't fully appear so. Despite coming to grips with their choices, that didn't help this game's main flaw. While yes, this game is insanely addicting like all other versions of Tetris, 
its PE sorter may play a role in this being one of the most unfair Tetris games to play. Unlike today, where all seven pieces are placed in a bag, shaken around, and pulled out at random until you reach the last piece, at which they're put back in the bag and shaken back up again once more, this game pulls a random piece every time. You may get six or seven square pieces back to back, you could even get S's and Z's all the way down, causing you to lose your game. This is going to be a problem in all of these Tetris games, the grab bag analogy wasn't ever thought of until much later. Some people though actually prefer the more random method used here. I'm not one of those people. Even though that hurt my experience, I still had a lot of fun. This game at its core is still Tetris. Yes, it predates the Game Boy and NES Tetrises. But this game is fire. The music truly shows that, with tracks such as Troika being a slow prance upwards, building anxiety through its musical notes. This piece has elements of what would become the main theme of Tetris, but doesn't quite hit the same. Here, have a listen. The next track is Karinka. I believe this is a mistranslation of Kalinka, a traditional Russian dancing song. This piece is much more of a jaunty tune, and one that I really preferred. However, it's rather short, only a couple of loops, you'll probably want to change the music since it only lasts about 30 seconds. Of course, there's one more track here, Technotris. This is a techno-inspired track based on Euro raves. This piece was my favorite track, and it seems to be one that stuck with a lot of people who played this game. It has appeared in more Tetris games than both of the other songs in this title combined. That's not to say all the music here is original. In fact, all of these tracks originate from the Atari Arcade version. Here's a comparison to Technotris, for example. So I talked about the music, I talked about the strangeness in the controls, but the real lacking center here is the visuals. They feel like very early NES visuals. Not much detail, very little shading, not even very much color, using only around four colors per screen. Yellows and golds and oranges on the title screen, and white, green, and red for the gameplay itself. The pieces, the backgrounds, the only other color here is black. Visually, this game's lacking. But I still had fun. Would I recommend this version? Only if you're going to get this with the more recent Tetris Forever collection. Well, it's not out at time of recording. I would certainly say this is worth your time if you're into playing some odd parts of history and looking at what makes it so special. Going back to our story from earlier, Sega had to pull the Mega Drive version of Tetris from shelves and production lines out of fear of Nintendo pressing legal action. Atari games, Atari games being one of Nintendo's main competitors at the time, didn't back down, however, mostly fading from people's memories with flops such as the 5200 and 7800, pushing them more into home computer markets rather than sticking to game consoles. Atari ends up suing Nintendo, or at least trying to. During this time, Atari believed that they had the home console rights to Tetris. However, they didn't go straight to Alexi, instead picking up the rights from one of the previous rights holders for the home computer version. I told you this was rights issues hell. Of course, Nintendo had already gone the proper route and asked Alexi for his blessing, as well as the proper license going there with BBS. Atari was already barred from making the NES title through the Nintendo seeing that Atari likes to push out games fast, but not at the quality they wanted. Nintendo and Atari had already been in talks to release their Nintendo Entertainment System in the West years prior, but plans fell through. Atari wanted nothing to do with the games industry, especially when the video game crash happened and the market was seemingly dead in the United States. With seeing time to pounce, Atari created a shell company known as Pengen. Take that heat. 
they were producing games like Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man, and Fantasy Zone. They partnered with Namco and Sega, and were even releasing original titles like Baseball using Nintendo's own lockout chip against itself by sending high voltage to the lockout chip. Atari was able to buy past the PS and release as many games as they saw fit for as long as they wanted. All of it would come crashing down with one of the NES's more rare titles, Tetris. It was on sale for only four weeks before a, pre four weeks before a preliminary injunction was issued. The game was pulled from shelves afterwards. Nintendo would ultimately end up winning the case against Atari. Atari really should have backed down from the Tetris fight, but being ever so petty, it may have well crashed the entirety of Atari games, nearly bankrupting the company, and Atari was eventually sold. But that's a different story for another time. We're here to look at Tetris on NES, more specifically, Tengen's Tetris Ring. Will it pick up from where BPS software left off, or will it fall off like Nintendo wanted it to? When playing an unlicensed NES game, there's an air of issue, problem, a high feeling of lack of quality, especially knowing where Atari has been in the past with their 2600. However, Tank and Tetris surprised me with vibrant colors, soft music. Everything was easy on the ears, and there were a slew of modes that were lacking from Bulletproof Software's attempt at porting Tetris to Famicom. Part of what helps this game is the fact that Atari had already worked on Tetris with Sega. Going into the game, I was fully expecting a lack of colors just like BPS's attempt, only to notice that the pieces changed color for every piece. As they land on the board, they become a dull gray, blending into the background, allowing me to continue focusing on the pieces that were coming. I wasn't expecting such a level of thoughtfulness from the gameplay, but that continued to be my surprise. The music in the game was well-programmed. There wasn't a weird buzzing like Technotris's track from Tetris by BPS. While that track wasn't here, Kalinka and Troika were, and two new tracks to listen to were added as well. Loginska and Bradinsky. The tracks didn't blow me away, and they still sounded much better than BPS's attempt. Speaking of much better, the controls here are thankfully fixed. Atari clearly knew the hardware at this point. Tengen had released multiple NES games, and their lockout chip method, while brutal, allowed them to really understand the hardware. The music sounded good, the graphics looked fine, sure it wasn't on the level of, say, Capcom or Nintendo themselves, but as an air of professionalism that you'd find in early Konami titles and some of Namco's offerings, like Rolling Thunder. I would have loved to see what they could have produced later on down the NES's lifespan. I would have also really preferred to see what they could have done on the Super Nintendo. The game itself is rather simple. The pieces fall at a consistent rate, no more stalling pieces if you tapped or mashed to the left or right against walls or other pieces. The game is a soft drop feature, allowing you to better maneuver your pieces around other pieces on the board. I am a bit disappointed they removed the hard drop function from the game, but to go along with this, they included Sega's version of the multiplayer, where you both battle for score. They also added a garbage block mechanic, and speaking of multiplayer, on top of the battle mode, there's a cooperative mode, where you both placed on the same board, and have to place pieces together to clear lines. These are both modes that would come back in later Tetris titles made by the Tetris Company. This game really does feel ahead of its time. While there is no hold function, the game feels like a modern Tetris title, even if the piece-grabbing algorithm is still technically a mess. I didn't manage to get quite as far as I did in BPS's Tetris, mostly due to the fact that when you finish a round, the pieces stay on the board this time around, forcing you to clean up after yourself. As the pieces begin to drop faster, however, with a slight pause in between the game, it didn't feel like it was rushing to beat me down like BPS's Tetris did. I felt at the end of my time playing with this game that it was a real shame that this game had to be pulled from shelves due to the licensing. This game could have rivaled Nintendo's version, and really should have. 
I've heard multiple people say this before, but now I truly understand that Tengen was ahead of its time with this version of Tetris. I would have absolutely recommended this version if it wasn't so expensive. Being pulled from shelves so early didn't allow as many kids to buy this title, so since this game is hard to get your hands on now, and not really worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars like the resellers want you to think, your best course of action is to ask the Tetris company to re-release this on modern platforms. It worked with Tetris the Grandmasters, and I feel like it's the only way we're ever going to actually see this come back. Seeing as Tetris Forever is being developed by Digital Eclipse and coming out soon, it seems like we might see some DLC for this, much like their critically acclaimed Atari 50th collection which added more interviews and more games to it, Tengen's Tetris would be an amazing title to add here. Especially since Atari owns part of Digital Eclipse, this shouldn't be a Tetris title forgotten by time. But the next one definitely hasn't been forgotten. This is the part of the story everyone knows. Howard Lincoln sent a cease and desist to Atari for Tetris, and Hank Rogers had already gotten the license for Bulletproof Software and Nintendo for the US and Japanese rights. Nintendo had a new console coming out that very few people knew about called the Game Boy. And this part of the story is so famous, it actually got a whole movie made about it. If you're ever wondering, how could you possibly make a Tetris movie? You should probably look into the history of how Tetris was made, and the craziness behind the rights issues. Kinda like what we're doing right now! Tetris launched as a pack-in for the Game Boy, and later that year, Nintendo released their version of Tetris, and they developed both versions in-house. However, this version of the game did not come out in Japan. They were stuck with Bulletproof Software's version. The only people to get this version of the game were Europeans and Americans. Overall, the NES version isn't quite as popular as its Game Boy counterpart. In fact, when it released, it was overshadowed by the Game Boy version almost entirely. Nowadays, entire tournaments are held based on this title. It's one of the greats. It's one of those I've really never heard people shut up about. My husband, when we were first going out, actually picked up this game because he really loved it. I was really skeptical, but then I watched him just blitz through. And while there's a hard crashing point for this game, and not and it's not really programmed as solidly as Tengen's Tetris, I really can't wait to delve into what makes this one so different from the other two. This game feels radically different if you've played the other two before it. In fact, this game feels snappy, almost clicky. Something about the sound effects mixed with the gameplay just works. Uh, of course, we're sticking with the same control style as Tengen's Tetris. In fact, it's the same control scheme that was in Game Boy Tetris, also developed by Nintendo. But this game moves a little faster, compared to the Game Boy original. Uh, probably since it's not being bogged down by a poor screen or weaker hardware. Would I say that the speed makes the game better? Maybe. I certainly do like the tightness in the controls, and the speed is a bit nice. But sometimes it's a bit too tight, and I end up overcorrecting my controls. That could be on me, but still, the game is just a little bit too tight for what I enjoy in Tetris. Which is an odd complaint, but it's how I feel. The one thing I like here is that Nintendo builds off the building blocks that BPS had already laid out for them. The blocks had multiple different colors, although they stuck with the same four for all of them. Uh, unlike in BPS's original though, the colors change when you get to the end of a new stage, so it keeps things nice and fresh. Unlike in BPS's original, also there are more modes here, Game A and Game B. In Game A, it's a simple marathon run where you have to clear out as many lines as possible to get to the farthest level that you can. Meanwhile, Game B puts you up against a certain number of lines that you have to clear, and then once you clear it, you move on to the next board. I don't feel like either are inherently perfect ways to do Tetris. Having the line clear be your goal is just like in BPS's Tetris, and I think it's fine. But I also like the marathon run and how it feels like a real sprint to the end to see the highest score you can get. 
If I had to pick which one I enjoyed more, I think I'd go with game B and its amount of lines. I just feel like there's more of a goal there to work towards. But neither are inherently bad, and both game modes would end up coming back in nearly every Tetris version since, whether developed by Nintendo or not. Upsettingly, this is also another NES Tetris version that won't let you save your high score. There's no save battery here, which is a shame. I can understand it, though. Nintendo wanted to probably save money on the cartridge, seeing as it might have been one of the NES's best-selling games like it was for the Game Boy, and with lower costs, you can make the games cheaper so that you could sell more. Get it into more homes, get more people playing, get more people talking. Cheaper games, better for everybody. But it is a real missed opportunity, and I do want to point that out. And when I examine this game as a whole, it's really hard to not point the finger back at the Game Boy version. Honestly, the Game Boy version is really a older brother version of this game. It had nearly the same dev time, nearly the same looking blocks. It's got pretty much the same music, although it is softer on the ears, since there's more audio channels to work with on the NES, but this game is pretty much the same as the Game Boy version. So, if you're going to play this one, it's kind of hard to not play this version along with their Game Boy version uh, to have the full package. Obviously, I won't be talking about the Game Boy version too awfully much, but while this game's got a vast improvement where sound and graphics are concerned, I do feel like the NES version is a bit lacking in game feel. I feel like the Game Boy version just is a bit smoother to play, probably due to the lower speeds. I do like the higher speeds of the NES version, but with the controls being as tight as they are, it's just a little bit harder for me to get into this. I love the fact that the NES version it sounds and looks better. It is all around a fantastic thing to see, especially since most Game Boy to NES conversions were very samey. When this version released, it was originally seen as the lesser of the two versions of Tetris, although nowadays we see this version be talked about more and more, there's even tournaments being held with just this version of the game. Honestly though, the one part that's lacking in this game is the multiplayer. The Game Boy version has a multiplayer mode if you use a link cable allowing you to compete for high scores. Meanwhile, the NES version just doesn't have that, which is a real shame. Now you may say that these are kind of nitpicks. So yeah, the game's controls are a bit too tight. So yeah, what if the NES version doesn't have the multiplayer? And they really are nitpicks, but I feel like I need to nitpick this game. This game was developed in-house at Nintendo, and while it's got the Nintendo charm, it doesn't feel like it has quite the amount of polish it needed. In some respects, I've wondered if this version of the game was rushed out to try to beat Tengen to market, but it just doesn't feel right. So yes, am I nitpicking this game? Absolutely. Does that impact my thoughts on the game? Not really. The game's got charm to spare, there's Nintendo cameos at the credits, the controls feel nice and snappy and clicky, which is great, and there's even a little easter egg on the high score table. Howard, Odasan, Lance, and Alexi all appear on the high score table, those being some of the developers and localizers for the game, including Howard, probably best known for his Nintendo Power appearances in Howard and Nestor. Although, nowadays, he's more likely known as the guy who stopped Mario 2 the Lost Levels from hitting the states early. While the grab bag analogy still isn't implemented here, I do feel like this game is rather rude with his S's and Z pieces. It seems as though the RNG is rather quick to give them to you back to back. So, if I had to recommend this version, I would say play it if you've got Switch Online, and play it if you really want to see what Nintendo can do with Tetris, but I'd also recognize that this is an early version of Tetris. It should be compared with BPS's version, not so much Tengen's version. I think Tengen's version's a little better in my honest opinion, 
But this game is being re-released, and at least you can play it rather simply. It's also not a very expensive cart, only going for about $15 here in the States. So if you really want to try this one, give it a go. You're really losing nothing. Boom, catch us for Jeff. Boom, catch us for Jeff. Hold up for just a second. The video is not sponsored, but we do have something for sale. We worked on a Tetris themed fursuit that you've seen in this video. He's got hands, he's got a tail, he's got a head, and he comes with the cartridge of original NES Nintendo Tetris. So please, if you're interested at all, reach out to us at, at GavinDragonYT on Twitter, Blue Sky, or the Discord down in the description. He's $3,000 and we're really trying here. It's because of viewers like you that we're able to shoot this video in the first place, so please, if you want to keep this channel alive and know somebody who wants this suit, please have them contact us. Thank you guys so much. Now, let's get back to Tetris. This is a very neck and neck match. It's this is one of the lesser known titles. Most people don't really talk about this game. And while it's had a lot of ports, it's never really caught on like Tetris. Tetris was released around 1990 to 1991, and later on in 1992 for the NES, which is the version we'll be looking at. It was initially a game developed in partnership with a studio known as Paragraph and Bulletproof Software. While BPS got the license and did some of the development on the NES version, Alexei Pazhentov and Vladimir Polkilko did most of the designing, planning, and development of the main game release for arcades. Vladimir Polka. Da, 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 da. There were other such ports for the Sharp Wizard, the PC Engine, the PC 9801, the most famous two are probably the NES and Game Boy ports done by Bulletproof Software. In 2004, there was Hatchers DX, but that was only released in Japan for Java mobile phones. Then there was Hatchers G Mode, which was a more anime-inspired version of Hatchers, but it was also for Java mobile phones only in Japan. There's really not much to say about this game's history because not much is known. People haven't really asked about Hatteras. In fact, when searching for Hatteras, more people seem to be talking about Tetris than Hatteras. I couldn't even find very much on the studio paragraph. When searching for information, I did my best to get everything I could out of it, so instead of going on and on and on about the backstory for this game, I'm just going to tell you guys a couple of neat facts about the game. Like, for starters, there's a save feature that's completely disabled in the NES version of this title. Probably due to the fact that there's no save battery for the actual cartridge itself. The title screens are vastly different for both Japanese and US versions. While the US goes through a more Wizards, Kings, and Chess vibe, the original Japanese version has Alexi carrying hats in a field. Weirder than that, the menu was even a little different, with options being moved around and some of the color changing for the shot and stage selection. There was a cut sound test mode. Even the credits were just completely removed. The hat graphics differ from the US and the Japanese versions. I can't say which is better since they both have an equal amount of charm. Some of the Japanese songs are even cut from the North American release. If you want to know more though, I highly recommend you look at the cutting room floor. There's quite a bit there. Without further ado, let's get into Hattress. At first glance, Hattress seems as far removed from Tetris as Yoshi or Yoshi's Cookie is to the concept. It meets Tetris somewhere in the middle between a more traditional puzzle game and a matchmaking, line-clearing, addictive puzzle experience. The first thing to note when booting this game up is the pure charm. Whether it's the US or Japanese versions, there's a level of charm in this game that just makes me feel pure joy. It makes this game really feel like people really took their time and energy and care into crafting it. It's an experience that they really cared about and wanted people to feel and play. And already off the bat, it's worth playing from the visuals alone. The cute versions of Alexei and Vladimir on the menu, the mannequin heads that constantly change to famous figures throughout history and pop culture. 
and the great sprites of the hats that change as you get past further levels. The main gimmick of Hat Race is rather simple. Hats will fall down from the top of the screen, they'll switch left and right if you hit a button, and you have to match a set of five hats in order to clear them out. When you clear enough hats from the shop, you'll move on to the next shop. Shops are what they call levels here. The reason we're looking at the American version, though, rather than the Japanese original, or even the arcade version, is, well, one, this is a version with exclusive mechanics. As you clear certain types of hats, you'll gather up a set of eight heads, either Alexei or Vladimir. Pressing one of the buttons allows you to use one of these up, and Vladimir will swap stacks of hats, allowing them to be closer together or further apart depending on where you need them, but can only swap two sets of hats, and Alexei will slide down the pole and pull out the bottom five hats from a stack, and he can pull from any number of stacks, and he doesn't have to pull only five, he can pull four, three, two, or one from any stack. So you don't have to just pick one and go. And the fact that this isn't in the Japanese version is a little surprising. It's like they really wanted Americans to care about this game. No other version has this mechanic. The Game Boy version has a fire mechanic. And the arcade version doesn't have any of this. <laughs> and from the main mode, it just made this game really addicting to play. I couldn't put it down. Eventually, it got to the point where I had to show this to my roommates, and when they started playing, they couldn't put it down. The American version even gets a very cute coffee break ending with uh, Looney Tunes style animations. With the depth of the gameplay already being leaps and pounds ahead of the Famicom original, as well as the charm in the visuals just putting this one a step above that version, this is the version of the game I have to recommend. The music here is super charming, too. It's got this feeling like you're supposed to be enjoying this game. It's hectic, it's frantic. At one point, it felt like maybe it was maybe parodying the I Love Lucy chocolate factory scene with its musical cues. Of course, you don't get to pick any music at the start. It just starts from the start of one track and changes every round. I feel like that's a shame there should have been multiple mixes, but it's alright. Beggars cannot be choosers, as they say. When I started this one up, I was worried it was just going to be another Tetris knockoff. Maybe a weird bootleg when I was researching it. But learning that this is from Alexi and that this game was something they cared about and playing it and really getting a feel for it to understand it, I'm glad to say I played this one. I'm glad to say I can recommend this game. And while maybe it's a bit easier than Tetris, it's really worth a try. And this game really hasn't been re-released. And it hasn't been re-released as much as Tetris. So coming from that viewpoint, it's a little hard to say that I was seeing a high bar of quality. But I'm glad to say it was there. The hats look nice. The mechanics are good and fun. I can say without a shadow of a doubt, Tetris is a true sequel to Tetris. Don't sleep on this. This game deserves a remake with the added mechanics of the Flame plus Alexei and Vladimir. This game deserves a remake, a re-release, anything, really. It deserves more than what it got. It shouldn't be lost in 2006 mobile phones. If you're going to pick this game up, pick up the Tetris Forever collection and tell the Tetris company, we love Hattress. And this next game is just as good, and I can't wait to share this next one with you. Tetris 2 was developed by Chunsoft, best known for developing the Dragon Quest series. This game would spark many firsts and lasts for multiple people who worked on this title. So for starters, this is BPS's final Famicom title, but it's also the first time a Tetris title on Famicom has had a save battery for progress and high score purposes. The game's music is really well composed and was done by the legendary and kind of infamous Koichi Sugiyama of Dragon Quest fame. I won't go into details here, but he's not really a good person. However, most of his music that he's created is really, really good. 
To go along with this, Sun Kaza Ishihara, the president of the Pokemon Company, worked on the puzzle design for this game. He's even been quoted as being a huge Tetris fan. To round off my special mentions, Bombalus was designed by Akihiko Mera. He's worked on a lot of the console Pokemon titles and spin-offs, and even worked on Earthbound as a game and font designer. There were more people who worked on this game, but if I had to give accolades to them all, we'd be here all day. To say this game is stacked with talent is a total understatement. And to go further, this also sparked off the first time most of these people would be working together, and they would later come back together to work on the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series. This is the first Tetris title on Nintendo to have little to no involvement with Alexi. But I would say it works in the game's favor, since we did get one more Alexi puzzle game on Nintendo that I won't be covering here, known as Yoshi's Cookie. Perhaps I'll look at the interesting Yoshi games from in this era another time. Bombless is in fact a new game, and Tetris 2 is a far superior version of both Nintendo's and BPS's previous efforts. It was so good that Bombless's gameplay ends up in future Tetris titles, including Tetris Axis for 3DS. There was even a full remake for the Super Nintendo called Super Tetris 2 plus Bombless. These games, this game is so good, we ended up picking up both versions for this video. So without further ado, let's get to the real meat and potatoes of BPS's final Famicom venture. Tetris 2 plus Bombless strikes me first and foremost as very simple. But just because the colors in the title screen are super simple and easy, just a nice gray, a couple reds, it really enhances the music. It's almost underwhelming, but calming. And once you get into the actual game, is you start to see the most amount of content in a Tetris game. It only rivals Tengen's version. To top it off, there's a save battery. You get to put in your initials at the start, and it saves that along with your progress, but we'll get to how your progress is saved later on. Starting with the Tetris mode, because of course that's what we're here to talk about, right? Game A is a marathon mode. There's no real end to it, and the visuals are nice. There's lovely flowers, the music is relaxing. It's got almost a homemade feel, like a nice afternoon in a, an older home. The blocks have different colors and they fade into the background with a nice blue, almost like Tengen's gray. It's perfect. To go with that flow, the pieces are snappy and loose somehow. They snap left and right, but they fall to the bottom with a nice loose feeling. Like a nice mix between Tengen and Nintendo's versions of these games. With a soft drop being here and there's not being a hard drop, it just makes the game feel really effortless. I would love to see a hard drop in this version of the game, but without it being here, it's just fine the way it is. The gameplay just feels effortless because of this, and it creates a nice feedback loop where I just want to keep playing. To add to the new features, if you pause and then press select, you can change the music tracks for whatever game you're playing. There are six tracks in total, and seven if you count the silent mode, and the music all fits really well here. It's relaxing, it's calming, there's frantic pieces, there's pieces that feel like they fit perfectly in Dragon Quest. Honestly, I'd love to see an RPG that uses some of these tracks as possible remixes, just to see if anybody would notice the lay motifs found in here. But game A is very simple, it's just a marathon mode. Getting into game B, however, there's a lovely line clear mode. Now, you're not having to clear 40 lines out here, but that keeps a nice quick pace. And with each new level, there's garbage blocks added to the bottom of the screen that you also have to clear out or at least contend with for the entirety of the stage. The game's got a nice quick pace to it. It speeds up at the end of every round. The rounds are nice and short, so you don't have to feel like you're moving too slowly, like in, say, NES's Tetris, where you have to clear out 40 lines. You don't have to get good to start moving quick. The game will move quicker, and you just gotta keep up which is nice. 
it's refreshing to feel like the game doesn't want to waste your time. There are multiplayer modes here as well, where you can send garbage blocks over to the other player. But what's so cool here is that they've actually thought about the competitive scene just a little bit. If you press select at any time during the game, you can hide your next upcoming piece from your opponent, not giving them the chance to see what piece comes after the piece they see on their screen if you're moving at a faster pace. Game B also has this amazing old saloon vibe, like it's the old west. It's just nice. Of course, while I find the line clearing modes to be rather nice, I think game C is where it's really at. You got this nice rustic garden aesthetic with a lion head that spills water, and that just matches the entire game mode here. At first you won't notice it. You'll place a couple blocks, you might make a line or two, and then it happens. Garbage blocks begin rising from the bottom of the screen and you have to take those out. It's like you're filling a glass with water. It's a race to clear it out. This mode was incredibly addicting. I absolutely adored this mode. If this mode were to come back in future Tetris games, I would love to see the Tetris pieces be themed after, say, water. I know that Tetris Effect has a couple of different modes that are kind of like this, but really, this is where it's at. This is the most challenging mode on the Tetris side of this cartridge, and honestly, I think that this version of Tetris for NES should be the competitive one. Not so much Nintendo's version, but hey, what do I know? But so far, so good. Tetris 2 is a great game, but we're only looking at half the coin here. So, let's look at Bombless next. In Bombless, the goal is very similar to Tetris. Blocks will fall, they've got bombs attached to them. The blocks on the pieces are 1 to 5 instead of 4. Clearing lines only counts if a bomb is on the line, and the bombs explode larger if you clear more lines each time. Combine 4 bombs to make a big one that'll clear out about half the board. Gravity becomes a factor with these blocks if they aren't attached to another block after a bomb explodes. So you can clear half a line or a whole line, it just depends on where you place the bombs as they fall. And honestly, this makes you really think about not only piece placement, but piece orientation. It makes for more depth and strategy. And honestly, I think that depth and strategy is what makes it probably the best mode on the cart Maybe even better than Tetris 2. It's as fun as Hatchers for me, and that says a lot. Our first mode here is the contest mode for Bombless. There's a hundred pieces per board, and you have to clear all the blocks. When all the pieces are gone on the board, you get a new puzzle and a new board to clear. The fewer pieces you use, the better score you'll get, and that is really addictive, because you might finish a round and then go, oh, I could do that one better, and then go back and retry it. The pieces may come at you randomly, but they don't feel like they're too random. They're usually around the same numbers for each turn. It works for a contest mode just to see who can get the lower score. And that makes this super addictive. It's great. And the visual loop is wild here. You have fantasy themes, and around the world themes, race cars, it loops after a little while, but you'll be seeing new visuals throughout each couple boards, and it just keeps things feeling fresh and nice. The other mode here is a puzzle mode. You can pick any board in any order, there's 90 boards, even more if you're playing the Super Nintendo version. You're given a set number of blocks, and you have to clear everything on the board. Kinda like the puzzle mode, but not really. It's great at teaching you the mechanics of the game. You can move at your own pace here too. Pieces don't start falling until you're ready. So if you really think about it, you can orient your pieces. You can see two or three pieces in advance and you can place them on the board kinda in your head before you start actually trying it. And if you fail the puzzle, you can just retry. You get stuck, you can move on. You can move at your own pace here and you can retry them at any time. And since this is 
where the game really starts to shine, in my honest opinion, I would say this is the mode to go to if you want to learn how Bombless works, and then jump to the contest mode when you're ready for more of a Tetris feeling game. Now, Tetris 2 Plus Bombless falls into that rare category of NES game that I feel can be called the programmable NES series. There were a couple of these early on in the NES's lifespan, but they didn't have save functions, or their save functions were incredibly obtuse, like the cassette saver for Excitebike. But here, it's got a battery on the cart, so you can save your creations, and you can create your own puzzle boards up to 10 spots for those. And then you can save them for later and challenge your friends with these, it was pretty neat, it's really robust, and honestly, I feel like this makes this game have endless replay value, especially if your friends like puzzles and you like making them, it's just perfect. It's got the real Mario Maker flair of creating a stage and seeing if your friends can figure it out. The SNES version had more puzzles and boards, but the NES version's got a lot of charm. And honestly, I prefer playing the NES version just because of that charm. This cartridge is truly one of the greats. If you're gonna play this one, play it on the Tetris Forever collection, you get both the SNES version and the NES version, and even in the Game Boy version of Bombless. So check this one out. This game is truly Tetris 2 in all the ways that count, and I cannot stress enough how much fun this game is. To call this game Tetris 2 is a bit of a stretch. In fact, while it may have been called Tetris 2 in the States, in Japan, where they got this title, this was called Tetris Flash. Much to some fans' dismay, this game is still in fact a Tetris game. It was developed by Nintendo in-house with Gunpei Yokoi as the producer. You may know him from creating the original Game Boy. There's actually three versions of this game produced. A version for the Game Boy, released around 93, a version for the Super Nintendo, released around 94, and lastly, what we'll be looking at today, the NES version, which was also released around 94. When talking about this game, though, it's really easy to get caught up in the fact that this game is called Tetris 2, yet doesn't feel anything like Tetris. But to think that this game came out in Japan under the title of Tetris Flash, it's pretty clear that this game isn't intended to be a pure Tetris type. It being a late NES, early Super Nintendo release, puts this in the same camp as games like Yoshi's Cookie and Wario's Woods, where both of those games got SNES and NES and Game Boy versions. There's some real symmetry between all of these titles. Now to say the release of this game was received mixedly is an understatement. Places like Electronic Gaming Monthly gave the NES version a 6 out of 10. Bimitsu gave the Famicom version a 21 out of 40. Game Pro gave the Super Famicom version a 5 out of 5, which seems like they weren't even trying, and Nintendo Power was even mixed, giving this game only a 3 out of 5. So some people love this game and other people hate this game, I even found that when asking my roommates about the title in particular. Even they were mixed about it. My husband hated the game, the graphics, and the gameplay. Casey could only stand the game on the Super Nintendo version and practically despised the Game Boy release. It's almost like this game is mixed to its very core. I suppose not having much to do with the original designer of Tetris would do that. This game almost feels like it's using the title of Tetris incorrectly, but we'll have to get to the gameplay to show you how that can even be the case. We've reached our final game for the video, Tetris 2, otherwise known as Tetris Flash. I will not be calling this game Tetris 2. It is not Tetris 2. It was never intended to be Tetris 2. This game had no involvement from Alexi, and I've been through most of the history so far. Nintendo developed this one, but it lacks the Nintendo charm, the Nintendo feel. I've played this game multiple times. The Super Nintendo version, the NES version, and the Game Boy version. The SNES version is off-putting to me. In the art style, the gameplay feel, it's sluggish and slow, and sometimes the pieces aren't even connected. Yeah, they only use four pieces, but that doesn't matter if the pieces are all broken apart. In normal Tetris flash modes, you have to clear a flashing block usually by clearing a line, like it's normal Tetris. Here, however, you have to clear three flashing blocks of three distinct colors, and when you do, it clears out all of that color and garbage blocks, and when you clear all three flashing blocks, you move on to the next stage. There's a real feeling of lack of modes here. The save battery is gone. The marketing for this game 
pushed it at some explosive adventure. I really think they got confused with Bombless, because there's no explosives here. And the game's not as great as what the advertisers or even Nintendo want you to feel. It's Dr. Mario with larger pieces. Dr. Luigi had that, and honestly I feel like Dr. Luigi did it better. But Tetris 2 exists. So judging it as a Tetris game is a little tricky because it feels more like Dr. Mario. It's a color matching game, it's not so much a line clearing game. While well, Hattress had the point of making five hats, it felt like a line, it was a stack, but it was a line. Meanwhile, here, you just put three colors next to each other, and it's done. You can't match things diagonally, it has to be left and right, or up and down. There is no mixing and matching. The entire game just feels not great. It's got the clickiness of NES Tetris. It follows in what BPS learned with Tetris 2, but... It misses the point. The art style here is Aztec and ley lines. It's crop circles. I like the theming. It's definitely a lot better than, say, cartoon family from the 1930s. But it doesn't quite hit the same way, say, a world-trotting adventure was felt with Tetris 2 for Famicom. It doesn't have the home feel that that game had either. In fact, almost every screen in this game is yellow. There's never really a break in the colors or the contrast, so every board feels kind of the same. And because of the way they've broken up the blocks and the pieces, and forced you to focus on individual colors within those blocks, rounds can either last 5 seconds or 6 minutes. And that's not okay, because your whole flow can get interrupted by just getting a couple bad pieces. And then again, I don't feel like you really lose much when you game over here. In fact, you don't lose anything at all other than your score. You get to try again immediately, there's infinite continues. The game feels like it can drop you in easy street or completely forget that you're there. You don't have to clear every block on the screen, so it's less of a garbage destroying game and you don't have to clear any of the garbage pieces half the time because you can maneuver most of the blocks at the bottom of the board. You can drop blocks off and then continue swinging the rest of the pieces around the board as long as the pieces weren't connected, like say an L piece. So I feel like it misuses the identity of Tetris. It misses the mark. None of the pieces really feel like Tetraminos. The flashing idea is a good one, but it just doesn't have the charm of, say, Nintendo's Tetris. It doesn't have the charm or the feel or even the music of BPS's Tetris. It's not Tetris. And I don't think I can grade it as Tetris. It may be a Tetris title, it may have gotten the license, but by George, this ain't Tetris. This is Dr. Mario with extra steps. The pieces are really simple, the shading is really bad here. Some parts look way too dark, in my honest opinion. It's clear why this game was as polarizing as it was. Because Tetris 2 should not have been given the title of Tetris 2. It should have stayed Tetris Flash, regardless of what any marketing team could have compared. This game doesn't need to exist. They should have just put out Tetris 2 plus Bombless, and called that just Tetris 2. It would have sold better, it would have done better, and I feel like players would have had a much better time. This game lacks Nintendo's charm, it lacks Nintendo's polish. The Super Nintendo version has the polish, but is missing the charm. The Game Boy version is completely a mess, just due to the fact that it's missing the color aspect. Honestly, if you want to try this one, it's not hard to get your hands on a copy. The game did insanely well just because it was called Tetris 2, but it may have been what put people off from Tetris for so long. Nintendo wanted to do something new with this game when Tetris is a game that doesn't need new. It doesn't need to be different. It just needs to innovate on what's already there. BPS understood that with Tetris 2 plus Bombless, but Nintendo doesn't do iterative sequels like most companies, especially not at this time. Zelda 1, top-down adventure. Zelda 2, side-scroller. Mario 1, 
left to right adventure, Mario 2, bottom to top adventure, and flipping Tetris on its head to make it feel like Dr. Mario isn't making Tetris better. It's making it different without understanding the core principle of what makes Tetris Tetris. So that's why when, say, Tetris plus Dr. Mario came out on Super Nintendo as a package, I think it did better. I think it felt better. Because all of a sudden, Tetris 2 was with Tetris, and it wasn't hiding what it was supposed to be. Meanwhile, this is very clearly pretending to be Tetris 2. I think it's a funny game. It's interesting to bring up in conversation. I'm glad I know the history about it. But I don't think I want to play it anymore. Thank you folks so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, comment, and share the video with a friend. I've been your humble host. Good night, everybody.